This morning we have our third presenter in the ninth annual Faculty Chalk Talk series. Um, Daryl Press is an associate professor in the government government department at Dartmouth. His research focuses on U.S. foreign policy, crisis decision making, military operations and strategy, and the links between energy and U.S. national security policy. Professor Press is the author of Calculating Credibility, How Leaders Assess Military Threats, and he's published uh, several articles in journals such as International Security, Security Studies, Foreign Affairs, and the Atlantic Monthly. Professor Press is a research associate at both MIT and Harvard, and he works as a consultant for the RAND Corporation. His current writing project is a book on nuclear deterrence during the Cold War and the future. Today's talk is entitled, Foreign Policy Trade-Offs in an Age of Austerity. Please welcome Daryl Press. So I, I should say, um, I, I caught the second half, as many of you guys did, at least, of uh, Mr. Sheehy's talk just now. And it was this justifiably uplifting talk about all the progress that Dartmouth is making in athletics, the success of Dartmouth sports teams, the, all the attributes of student athletes that we should be really proud of as a community, as Dartmouth alums, as faculty members. And I was feeling really terrific. And then I started looking at the notes for the talk that I'm supposed to give to you guys just now. And I thought, you know, first of all, national security, that's a bummer. And how can I make that worse in an age of austerity, right? So I was sitting there and I was thinking, maybe we should just cancel this talk. We should talk about the football game that's going to happen this afternoon or something like this. But of course, I promised you I would give this talk, so I will. Um, let me start by saying just a couple more words about me as background, which does actually connect a little bit to the talk I'm going to give today. Um, so my name is Daryl Press. I've been teaching here at Dartmouth for 11 years. I'm a professor in the government department, and I'm also affiliated with the Dickey Center. And with the Dickey Center, I am the coordinator of their War and Peace Studies program. Um, I've been here for 11 years. My wife is actually also a faculty member here, so we have this you know, crazy little Dartmouth household now. Um, we have two little kids, uh, we live in Hanover, so you know, we're really part of the Hanover community, the Dartmouth community, and I say this partly to say I'm happy to talk in Q&A, especially given the dreariness of the topic. In q and I'm very happy to talk about anything you guys would like to talk about, about life at Dartmouth, about you know, how Dartmouth is doing from the standpoint of a faculty member, or about these topics, etc. cetera. Um, my teaching and my research are very, very close to each other. Um, the types of classes that I teach and the subject matter within them mirrors very closely the research topics that I spend all my out-of-classroom time thinking about. Um, and the principal topics all involve um, um, kind of the nitty-gritty details of, of military technology, military operations, and how these things are changing. So how military technology is changing, how the, the means and the techniques of war are changing, and how that's affecting the regional balance of power in important regions, U.S. requirement for alliances, um, our expectations of, of uh, kind of the behavior of countries that we're worried about. And these are the kinds of things that I focus an awful lot in both my research and my teaching. Um, it drives my academic research. I also do um, a fair amount of, of, of work um, uh, for the Defense Department on these same problems. And, and they bring in outside experts occasionally um, to help them think through problems that they understand quite well but they nevertheless want outside kind of voices and outside ears talking about kind of how changing circumstances in East Asia or the Persian Gulf might affect the kinds of forces the United States should be buying in the future, which allies we really need in these various regions, how we should be basing, et cetera, et cetera. But I say all of this as a prelude to say that the kind of presentation I'm about to give now even though the topic area overlaps very much with a lot of the stuff I've published and also with the stuff I, I, I talk with, with the Navy in particular and the Air Force about, this kind of analysis is something that I've, in a, in a way, I've never presented, and it's totally different from that kind of work. And this is important. And the reason it's important, the reason it's different is because the questions that, for instance, the Defense Department asks of itself and asks of outside consultants in general are questions about 
the best means, the best techniques for executing the current national security policy. Because they appropriately take orders from the civilian leadership, and the civilian leadership appropriately dictates what the national security policy is going to be, and it's the military's job to try to execute that strategy. So the questions that the Defense Department is always wrestling with is, how can we execute the existing national security policy given budget constraints, given changing technology, et cetera? And so how should we change the kinds of weapons we have, the kinds of alliances, the basing structure, et cetera? This project here led me to ask a very different kind of question. And, 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 and it's led me, again, to produce PowerPoint slides, which I've never seen the likes of which in, you know, in, in that building, in the Defense Department. And to, to say things and articulate things, which I'll do, which I think, frankly, would shock the people who I talk with on a regular basis, because they're not asking me these questions. But I have to say, the process of putting these together has been a little uncomfortable for me, because then I ask myself, gosh, I'm, I think I'm being honest to everybody. I'm answering everybody's questions honestly. But it is striking to me how different the sorts of conclusions are. And so what I do in this presentation is I'm not asking how to best implement the strategy. I'm really asking the question, is the current national security policy sustainable, viewed through the lens of the budget? That's the question I'm asking here, a question no one's ever asked me from Washington. I don't think they, they asked the Defense Department in general. OK, let me say one last thing, kind of a, a, an introductory um, statement, which is, wh why am I talking about austerity? Um, we're in a recession. It was a bad recession, or it is a bad recession. I guess the recession is over, but it was a bad recession. We still have a lot of unemployment. We're going to grow out of this. I, I believe that, actually. The recession will pass. So why should we be thinking about an age of austerity? It's a moment of deficits. We'll get past that, right? We, we always seem to. So, so, so that's something that I want to address immediately. And the presentation I want to give you has four parts. First of all, what is the problem? What is the problem? When I say I think we're entering this age of serious austerity for a long time in the future, why is that? What's the problem that's driving that? Number two, what's the plan such that it is for dealing with that problem? And some of it stems from this 2001 Budget Control Act, which is the kind of the, the conclusion of the nasty budget fight that we just had to raise the debt ceiling. Number three is it leads to the question of would defense cuts be prudent? Now, I mean, who knows? Budget, the budget might get bad enough that we have to make defense cuts whether they're prudent or not, but it's worth asking would it be prudent? And then number four, I'll talk just a little bit. Well, no, I'll talk about a more modest national security strategy. So that's what I'd like to do in the next few minutes. So first of all, what's the problem um, I don't think any of this will be a surprise to you guys, but we should just be clear about it. So this is part one. This is the short-term problem. And it's just that we have, for the last 10 years, we've been accumulating on an annual basis a deficit each year. And it was a small deficit until the financial crisis, and it became a big deficit. And why did it become a big deficit? Two things happened. Big, oh, I'm sorry, so the top of the slide here is government revenues, and the bottom of the slide is government expenditures and the line indicates the net surplus or deficit. These are CBO, this is a CBO slide, I should say. Um, and so not surprisingly, when the financial crisis hit and we went into a steep recession, revenues dropped, because lots of people lost their jobs, lots of companies became unprofitable. And so the revenues the US government took in dropped. And furthermore, then a lot of these folks who lost their jobs, well, not, almost all of them, went on unemployment rolls, of course, and so the drains on the, the expenses for the federal government increased. So revenue dropped, expenses increased, deficits ballooned. And then we also had the, you know, the bailouts and we had the stimulus programs, et cetera, which added to it. But, but that's, that's a story we all know. You know. This story we all know pretty well, too. It's part two of the problem, which is as a result of these deficits, we have accumulated over the years, and especially in the last few years, a significant amount of debt that we're now carrying. And I have to say, this slide looks quite different than a lot of the super alarmist slides you'll see if you troll the internet. And I think this is a better way of viewing the debt, which is you should think about the severity of the debt on the basis of the fraction of GDP that it reflects. You know, if you owe someone a billion dollars, well, for me, that's a big problem. <laughs> for the federal government, that's not much of a problem at all, right? Because it matters what's your income base from which you have to pay that debt. So, the point is, the U.S. debt has grown pretty steeply as a result of the deficits I just showed you in the last few years. Now, it's not at historic highs, 
We had a much higher debt as a fraction of GDP, not surprisingly, during World War II. But nevertheless, it's, it's higher than it has been for a good part of US history, and certainly most of recent history. So that's part of the problem number two. But it's nothing yet to get super alarmed at, at least in my view, because the deficits will reduce when we pull out of the recession or, or when the growth increases. And the debt, as we show, when we grow, the debt as a fraction of GDP will drop. Here's the last piece of the puzzle. And this is what really the problem is, is that we're entering a period of time, and it's well understood and pretty easy to predict, in which we're not only going in with a deficit and with a fair amount of accumulated debt, but we know government expenditures are going to go through, increase dramatically in the coming years. Why? Because of the demographic caused, driven increases in social security spending and government, these are government, federal government health expenditures. Only federal government health expenditures. So principally Medicare, Medicaid, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the CHIP program. Um, but the point is, um, today, the major federal government health programs and the social security expenditure equal about 10% of GDP, okay? In 20 years, we're estimating about 15% of GDP. So a sizable increase. And it's worse than that. Because when you add on top of that, the, the debt implications and the annual interest costs of bearing the, that debt, just those three things, just Social Security plus Medicare, Medicaid, and interest, you know, again, we can quibble about the precision of anybody's estimates, CBO's estimates, but they're guessing 23% of GDP. To put that in context, total U.S. revenue from all tax sources today is about 15% of GDP. And just these programs are anticipated to eat up about 23% of GDP, which means, obviously, substantially increased taxes and just close the rest of the federal government. And you know, people have referred to it basically the federal government as being a big insurance company with an army. Well, it might just end up being a big insurance company. <laughs> um, now, I have to say, anytime I see projections, anytime you see projections, we should all say, OK, you know, how many economists you have in the room, that's how many projections you have. Uh, and, and, uh, and they do better than political scientists. So I, you know, we should all have skepticism. But I would point out a couple things. So number one is the time frame of the big increases. It's not like we're saying, well, we're OK for 10 years, and then it's really going to increase. We're talking about the near term. We're talking about changes that are happening in this decade, number one. Number two is the big drivers in this increase, I'd say it's 90% fact and only 10% speculation, which is the principal facts we know. We know what the debt burden is today. We know what the demographic profile of the United States is today and what the changing ratio of workers in the workforce versus folks retired collecting Social Security and Medicare benefits. That's a fact. The things that we don't quite know are what, what are interest rates going to be? And that can make the interest payments bigger or smaller. We don't quite know how quickly health care costs per person will increase. But do keep in mind that, again, all the great work of the folks here at Dartmouth, at, at TDI, at the, at the, the Dartmouth Institute, have you ever have you heard them talking about you know, bending the cost curve? Have you heard that on health care spending? What they're talking about is decreasing the rate of growth of health care costs. And that's aspirational. And I'm glad we have so many really smart people working on that. But basically, nobody talks about decreasing health care costs. It's just kind of off. It's, it's wishful thinking. So the point is, is the, the difficulties that we're facing going forward is not that we're in a recession today, that we have deficits today, that we've accumulated some national debt. Yes, those are all true. The big problem is we have this economic problem, this fiscal problem today, and we're headed into this knowable situation where the drains on the federal treasury are going to be substantially increased. All right. I told you it was a little bleak. It gets better at the end, less bleak, I promise you. <laughs> hey, and let me kind of once say, um, and, and it, this is pandering. I'm going to pander, but I also mean it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's both true. Which is, don't take from this that I think that, oh, what we should do is vastly cut Medicare and Social Security. I, you know, you know folks who've spent their entire lives contributing through payroll taxes to these programs, number one, have a reasonable basis of saying, by the way, those things you promised to me are mine. 
And furthermore, besides that argument, there's another argument, which is a powerful argument, which said folks who are nearing or are in retirement have made savings plans on the basis of the, of the promises that our society has made to them. So to me, this is not a slide that says, blame the over 60s. This is a slide that says we have big fiscal problems. All right. So what is the plan? And there is kind of a plan um, to deal with this. Um, so the res, and I want to kind of preview. I don't think we're going to stick to this plan. I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> But this is the plan. Um, so the Budget Control Act of 2011 put caps on spendings in a variety of categories. So it raised the debt limit, but put caps on spending. Now, of course, all the caps that Congress sets, Congress can then, in the future, remove if it gets too politically uncomfortable, of course. But we set caps on spending, number one. Number two, the mechanism that at least is on, uh, scheduled to occur on the basis of current law to vastly increase tax revenue is that nobody, of course, wants to stand up, especially near an election year, and say, I want to raise taxes substantially. So the mechanism that people anticipate is the just allowance of the, what people refer to as the Bush tax cuts to expire. And they'll fight and they'll point fingers and you did it, no, I, you did it, and it was, you get the idea. Um, and also there's, uh, you know, kind of other things in the weeds. There's um, perhaps non-indexing um, of the alternative minimum tax. There are a variety of steps of non-action that are kind of in the plan, which would have the effect of big tax increases. So the bottom story is there's a tax increase element, there are spending caps elements. If we do the plan, it's going to be painful, and I'll, give you, I'll show you a little bit. It's going to mean taxes will end up significantly higher than historical U.S. averages. It'll mean that we're going to see in the next, not in the 20-year future, now, in the next few years, major changes in the role of the federal government in our society. All right, why do I say this? Um, and again, this is, all, this is all CBO data, by the way. I didn't make this up. They made it up. Totally different. <laughs> um, so here, CBO compares the revenue the United States government is, is drawing from the society historically over the past 40 years against what will be drawn from the society 10 years from now according to the current plan, if we stick to that plan. And the point is, you know, over the last 40 years, we've averaged about 18%. So 18% of GDP was pulled out of, out of the, uh, the private economy and taken by the federal government in the past. And in the current plan, if we just do those things I said, let the Bush tax cuts rep um, repeal or uh, uh, expire and, and don't index the AMT, in, in 10 years, that'll be up to 21% from, eight, from, from the historic average of 18 to 21, which is a 17% on average tax increase. Now what fraction will end up being borne by personal income tax filers? What fraction will be borne by companies who will then pass on the cost to the personal income ta tax filers through purchases? Who the heck knows? But that's a 17% increase that's going to come from somewhere and it's, it has to come from us. A little bit more alarming than that is that we are now at a historic low in terms of tax rates. I don't know how far back, but, but certainly relative to kind of recent history. And and that's for a variety of reasons we can talk about, but we're only at about 15% now. So when you compare what the federal government's gonna be taking from the US economy in 2021 versus what it's taking from now, it's more like a 40% increase. So again, you can say, well, that's terrific, or you can say that's terrible, and that's up to you, we all have our own opinions, but the bottom line is it's gonna, we're gonna feel a tax hit. Okay. Typically, people feel tax hits, but, but well, let me leave it aside, okay. Second thing is, and this won't be a surprise now after the other slide, which is we're expecting a higher fraction. Oh, the y-axis on this, by the way, is, is percent of GDP. It's the same y-axis on all these, these ones that you're going to see. So it's percent of GDP. So 18% to 21. Um, not surprising, relative to the historic amount of GDP we've been spending on Social Security and federal health programs of about 7%, it's going to go up just in this decade to about 12%. Again, just based on the demographic tables. And that's partly going to be paid for by here, but not fully. Where is the rest going to come from? And the answer is, and this we're going to have to dwell on a little bit, what is in this category? What is in that little column there? Again, that's roughly today 11% of GDP. And that is everything else that the federal government does, with the exception of paying interest on the debt. So every single thing you read in the newspaper the federal government did, um, like the space program, that's in it. You like the defense budget, the Department of Defense, that's in it. The CDC, uh, uh, immigration and customs, the FBI, 
highway funds, air traffic controllers, anyone here ever fly? Air, air traffic controllers, um, everything, EPA, some people like the EPA, some people hate the EPA, FDA, every single thing the federal government does, including the fence, is there. And again, in the plan, in order to make these numbers add up, that's gonna drop from where it's both, it's at its basically 40 year average now, about 11 to 12 percent, to, hold on, 7 percent. So we're gonna basically take 33 percent off the top of everything the federal government does, with the exception of these things. Um, what does that mean? Well, one clear implication is, well, defense is half of that, of that column there. So, um, so I heard um, um, candidate Romney say at a recent debate that if there's a Romney presidency, he's not touching defense. Defense will not be cut. Now, there's wiggle room there because it's not quite clear what that sentence means. We could talk about that. But, <laughs> but suppose, and a lot of people believe this, and a lot of people feel this is the right policy, and it might be the right policy. We'll get into this. But suppose that's the right policy, and we say we're not cutting defense. Well, that means that you're going to have to take your 33% haircut after setting aside 50% as untouchable. What does that mean? It means everything else in that column, which again is everything that the federal government does essentially, is gonna basically be a skeleton. Um, kinda, kind of bleak sounding. Um, uh, I'll have some good news in a second. This is not it. The, <laughs> um, now, nobody really believes we're gonna stick to this plan. <laughs> Why? Because those would be a, a tough tax bill to swallow, number one. And number two is those would be really difficult spending cuts to swallow. So nobody really believes in it. But as all these reports suggest is they say, we can kind of soften this blow in the next 10 years, but any delay we take in closing this gap means that when we do get around to it, maybe we'll start in five years instead of starting in 2013 as we're planning, we'll just make the actual changes, both the increases on tax and the cuts in revenues, steeper. So maybe we'll execute this today, meaning 2013, maybe we'll start executing it 2018, but if we do deviate from this plan, the, the reforms are gonna have to be steeper and more difficult than the ones I just demonstrated. All right. Um, so whether we execute this plan or not, we are entering not just a brief recession, but an age of significant tax increases and, I don't know, vast as alarmist, big cuts to all federal government activities, except for Social Security and health. Um, and again, if you, if you want to privilege defense in this, it's going to make it really, really deep on everything the federal government does. This is where I have in my notes. Take a step back and say, we don't need to jump off a bridge here. <laughs> um, this does not mean the United States as a country is about to collapse or be destroyed or that you should be stockpiling food supplies and shotgun shells. <laughs> it means that both tax rates and the provisions of the federal government are very likely to fundamentally change and it's gonna be a different sort of era for the next 10 or 15 years, or longer. There, I had to blow it. Okay, would defense cuts be prudent in this environment? So, let me tell you just a little bit about the defense budget. Um, 2011, um, we are spending, we are authorized to spend approximately $715 billion on national security. And, I, um, and there's two different colors there, the dark blue is what, the, what people call the baseline defense budget. And the baseline defense budget is what the Defense Department spends in that year to do all of its normal day-to-day -day activities. Maintain weapon systems, buy new weapon systems, pay personnel, do routine exercises, just the normal stuff for the function of the Defense Department. And the little blue line, not little, 150 billion on top, is the additional cost in the defense budget associated with the two principal combat operations that we're undergoing, Afghanistan and Iraq, which are both winding down. Okay, so there's the baseline defense budget of about 550, and the total defense budget's about 715, and that's what we spend. When CBO kind of try to, tries to map out what's the space in which we might consider future defense cuts, um, they went from, imagine, remember that cut that we're doing on the green column? One possibility, just to bound it, one possibility is that we don't take any of that from defense. That we basically, or we take very little from defense. That we basically freeze defense except for controlling for inflation. So we just give them CPI increase each year. So in real dollars, defense is flatlined. Now, defense will still shrink a little bit as a fraction of GDP because the economy is going to keep growing, but that's the highest end number they think is plausible. Alternatively, we might try to get more of that needed green cut from defense. And they imagine that, that 
uh, we can tell how they got these numbers, we can talk about it. But when they did these numbers out, and again, I controlled for inflation here. So the flat line on the blue, the nominal numbers would really be increasing in the next 10 years. But in reality, they'd be shooting to keep it basically at 550 billion a year. And so that's taking almost all the cost savings out of everything else the Defense Department does. That's the starve the beast approach of we only have an army and a healthcare system left in the federal budget. Then they imagined what they thought was kind of the steepest plausible defense cuts, um, which ended up at the end of 2021 being basically a 20% cut. And again, these are all controlled, I, I adjusted for inflation. So it's basically bringing down defense from 550 to 450. Okay, and that's kind of the range of space I think we ought to be talking about about defense. And so the question that you ought to ask yourself, I think, is first of all, you know, would that be sound? Would that, I mean, a 20% cut in anything, holy cow, sounds really steep. Is that sound? How do we assess the, the risks associated with such a steep cut? And it's worth even asking the question, you know, could you find greater savings in the defense budget? So how would you even address such questions? And I think, again, if you had, um, uh, I guess I can't say if, you know, if I had a $5 million research budget from the De Department of Defense, because they can't afford that anymore. Um, but if, if somebody, if the Department of Defense had millions of dollars, they would run lots of war games and lots of computer simulations and see how different force structures uh, kind of did or, or failed or succeeded in different scenarios. Um, I asked myself two, two questions, which is, let's kind of compare those two alternative levels of defense spending against historical U.S. levels of defense spending. Of course, making sure, number one, we control for inflation, a dollar is not a dollar across time. And number two, we in the back of our mind have to keep in mind the level of threats varying across eras, right? And the second thing you might want to do is compare U.S. defense spending against current <coughs> other countries. Because the reason we have a defense budget is not to match up against the United States in 1971, but to provide us security relative to other countries. So how does the defense budget look against those two measures? So here is, again, I control for inflation. Here's the U.S. defense budget since World War II. Good long period. And as you can see, in 2011 dollars, in the kind of non-war years, the Eisenhower years, the post-Vietnam years, the brief interlude between the end of the Cold War and 9-11, we were averaging around 380 or something in, in 2011 dollars, maybe 2010, it's the same thing. Um, and then we had the Korean War, which increased us to six, the Vietnam War, which got us to 510 in current dollars. And then this is kind of the war we paid for, but, but thankfully never fought, which was the Reagan buildup, which got us up to about 550. And now, since 9-11, we're up here. And so I guess I, I looked at this. I can't prove anything, and I can't show you who's right and who's wrong, but I overlay this against those, the top line number and the bottom line number, and I say, can, can we really make a straight-faced argument that frozen defense spending at 550 would clearly be inadequate. Um, it's substantially more than we spent in, in inflation-corrected terms throughout the Cold War. And in fact, even the worst case scenario of 20% cuts looks pretty darn healthy in a Cold War context. It's basically our Cold War defense budget. Now, my students here don't remember the Cold War. In fact, we're not born in the Cold War. But you guys do, and I do, and this is an opinion, but in my opinion, for all the talk that we have about the things that non-state actors could, could or do do to us on the worst days for us, their best days, and they are terrible, right? I mean, I, we all remember that. They are terrible, and people's lives were shattered, people's lives were lost, family, et cetera. I don't think you can really say with a straight face, I don't believe that the risks that we face in the world today are higher than the risks we face in the Cold War. It's, everyone likes to say that, because there's terrorism, plus there's uncertainty, plus there's cyber. And did you hear there's cyber? And terrorism could be really bad. And you know, again, the worst case scenarios people conjure up is terrorism with weapons of mass destruction. And 100,000 people could be killed in a, in a morning, and it's true. But remember the Cold War. We were talking about the possibility of civilization ending war, and a huge adversary with 100 plus armored divisions, or armored and motorized rifle divisions. It was a scary time, or a much big threat. And, we handled it at 450. So at least looking at this slide, and again, that's a one window in, I say, is 450 crazy? Could you possibly, with a straight face? I mean, you couldn't walk in the Defense Department and say, hey, I want to go lower than 450, or I think we could do fine on 300. But I look at this and I say, well, why, why not? Maybe there are good reasons. Okay, here's another window into this. 
So again, because we're not building a military to defend ourselves against 1952 America or 56 America, it's about current threats and scenarios. So let's do some comparative defense spending today. I didn't just pick any old countries here. These are the top 10 defense spenders. So these are the big, big bad ones, not in terms of intentions, but in terms of capabilities, okay? Some of those might surprise you. We can talk about them, but, but that's, that's who they are. Um, so where do we stand? We already know this. Um, we have a healthy defense budget, 550 to 715, including the contingency operations. Um, where does everyone else stand? That's the slide that always makes kind of people, students in my class, jaws drop. Um, and I didn't make this number, these numbers up, and I didn't forget a zero, I swear. Um, so a whole lot of things to say about this. One of them is, I study a lot of history. I spend a lot of time studying international politics and how politics have changed over history. It's very hard to find many time periods that look like this. The history of international politics is of usually at least two and often multiple countries within 15 or 20 percent of each other, the leading countries, people trying to establish balances, people competing. I mean, if you're coming from Mars and the first thing you see is this, you go, oh my, the world's got a problem. You know, Uncle Sam is going for it or, you know, it's... <laughs> and I don't think that's quite right, but I'm just saying this is striking. And also, what do all those blue countries have in common? They're, they're, they're basically our friends. Now, we can quibble. Now, some of you are thinking, France? No, that's not fair. They're our friends. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, Saudi Arabia, how good a friend are they? But, you know, we all have friends that we really like and friends that we kind of like, you know? So... <laughs> but this is pretty striking. I can summarize, there is an imbalance in global defense spending. Can we, can we agree that that's what this means? Now, some people say, well, this is totally unfair to our allies. I'm not very nice because these allies have small GDPs. So they're working really hard. They just got a smaller engine. Don't pick on the allies. Um, it, if you take it off, again, total defense spending, you put it as percentage of GDP and see how hard they're working. Huh. So we spend 4.7% of our GDP on defense at the moment. Britain. Working a little, they're at half our level roughly, two and a half. None of these other countries hits 2%. Um, there are some um, partners of the United States who do Israel's uh, at like six point something um, for because of their particular security threats. South Korea, I think, is in the twos because um, they live next to North Korea. Um, but again, it's, this isn't picking on our allies. This is the truth. Um, so again, just using these two metrics, which is, is taking a step back and not asking implementation of the current national security policy, but should we be actually having a national conversation about whether 450 is plausible, which nobody's willing to suggest yet, or maybe even you can make the case for a lower defense budget based on both the historical numbers of US spending over time in the comparison of the Cold War, and this, I mean, I kind of feel like if the Joint Chiefs of Staff stand up and say, there is no way we can defend the national security of the United States at $300 billion, perhaps the president should just fire them. Say, well, if you can't, I can certainly find someone who can, <laughs> you, you know? All right. So let me kind of do this real quickly. I want to get to questions. Um, of course, you should always think of these not just in terms of budget issues, but in terms of missions. And I always, and it's something I try to say to my students all the time, which is, if your position is we should increase defense or reduce defense, you should be able to tie it to the missions you want to accomplish. Military force, military power is a tool. It might be a tool you like, it might be a tool you don't like, but it's a tool. And how much of a tool you need depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, you know, I, I call the electrician when I got to change a light bulb. So I don't need a whole big set of expensive household tools. You know, other friends of mine are like building sheds or something. I don't even know. And they, but, but military force is like that as well. So what is our mission? And, and I think really this has not changed since the beginning of the Clinton administration. There are different flavors of it. But really, the Republicans and the Democrats who've been in, in foreign policy positions of senior leadership since the Clinton administration basically see the world in a very similar way. We could talk about which, what ways the Bush administration was a little bit different from this. But basically, the overall arching idea, and it sounds fuzzy and it is fuzzy, is this whole thing is about global leadership. The world's a better place when, we, when it has a leader, and we're a pretty good leader, right? Why? Because we're pretty benign. We don't like to kill lots of non-combatants. We're not trying to take other people's territory or possessions. So the whole mission is about global leadership. 
Um, a second mission is about protecting the commons, meaning free access to the seas. That's the, the, the engine of trade. It's about assuring our allies. We don't want them to do too much. We kind of like that 1% in the strategy. Because if they do too much, they might get in trouble with each other, or they might hurt their economies, I've heard it argued. They're going to overspend on defense, which could indirectly hurt us and our trade relations. I always worry, oh, geez, if, if spending 2% on defense wrecks your economy, which might indirectly help us, hurt us, what are we doing? But nevertheless, assure our allies, and of course, deter our adversaries. And the way you assure your allies and deter your adversaries is by being prepared to win and win decisively if somebody challenges you. That's the strategy. Where? You need kind of a mission and a location. Where? Everywhere. Because what could you possibly in this globalized, interdependent age say doesn't matter? You tell me something that doesn't matter and you're opening yourself up to a political disaster. So where? Everywhere. Even now, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're, we've set up a combatant command there. The one place we used to exclude, Antarctica is next. Not really. Not really. Um, but especially East Asia and the Persian Gulf. So what does this really mean? Now, we know, everyone who's been in this business knows that we have a terrible track record of predicting where we're going to have to fight and where we get into wars. But nevertheless, for the, purpose of, for the purpose of planning forces and planning foreign policies, you have to start with some idea of who potential adversaries might be and what potential contingencies must, might be. Otherwise, you have no way of prioritizing missions and prioritizing forces. And not surprisingly, the key ones that people look at as a combination of intent and consequence you know, a few kinds of contingencies in East Asia, a variety of contingencies involving the Korean Peninsula, a variety of contingencies involving China, not all China-Taiwan related, but that's really what, where the action is in East Asia from a national security standpoint. We do other stuff in East Asia. Fukushima happens and the U.S. Navy provides a lot of support. There's a tsunami and the U.S. Navy does humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, but those are the primary missions. And in the Persian Gulf, there's the the missions associated with Iran, a lot of them focus on the sea lanes here through the oil. They're the, they're the missions, the counterinsurgency and counterterrorism missions in Afghanistan seeping into Pakistan as well. But basically, we're preparing, and we try to prepare for naval and air operations in the Persian Gulf and around, naval and air operations around the Persian Gulf and particularly involving Iran, ground operations with air support associated with counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, naval and air operations in East Asia, and a mixture of air and ground operations on the Korean Peninsula. And that's really the space, and it's been the space for 20 years, basically. All right, it raises the question, well, what about these scenarios is so darn demanding that you need $715 billion of defense, when if you'll notice, China on that previous slide had about $115 billion. And North Korea was not on that slide, and I think their, their defense spending last year was, I think, $72 is, is um, <laughs> I'm exaggerating. And they, they spent a huge fraction of their GDP, but it's one of these things where a high fraction of a very small number is not a lot of money. But literally, North Korea does not spend very much on defense. Um, and then Iran, Iran spends high single digits of billions of dollars. Maybe it's now up to 10 or 15, but it's in that range. So what is it about these scenarios? How do you get from this, which is not the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, to $715 billion? And I think the answer is, and I, and I can't prove it, but I think the answer is basically, it's the requirements we set for these missions. And I see this every day in the work that I do for, for the government on this. So first of all, is everybody else with those small defense budgets are simply trying to cause us problems. In, in militarily, I mean, there are, the countries are doing millions of other things, but from a military standpoint, they're trying to build the capabilities to impede us, to cause us problems. They know they can't match up against us. So Iran's like, how could we harass? We could dump some mines in the Persian Gulf. We could do X, Y, and Z. We could put speedboats full of high explosives. They're doing harassment stuff. That, those are their goals from a military standpoint, if they have to fight us, impede us, harass us, annoy us, frustrate us. Our goal is outmatch them. So stop all that, defeat them conventionally, do it with basically close to no loss of life on the US side, and by the way, no com non-combatant loss of life on the adversary side either. Now, we never fulfill that exactly, but we've been f phenomenally successful over the past 20 years. But so our requirement is quite high on that, number one. Number two, is we do it without much help from our allies. We prepare to do it without much help from our allies, partly because of those numbers I showed you, they can't help. Now that's exaggerating a little. So in the, in the fights in Afghanistan, NATO has done things that helped. 
but we've had to do a lot of the logistics, et cetera. But basically, there's just not a lot of capability in the allied states to help. And lastly, we've decided that we need to not only defend, but wage these wars essentially simultaneously if they arise. And that's a key, that's the key driver, I think, which is the forces are designed, and I believe capable, of simultaneously, decisively defeating Iran in an air and naval war over there around the sea lanes, and simultaneously, decisively defeating China in an air and naval war in the Pacific, and actually maybe simultaneously winning the war on the Korean Peninsula if push came to shove. That we've decided that because we have these global commitments, and because we never want to be in a position where we say, hey, ally, I can't help you because I'm currently helping her, that we have to have the capabilities to do this simultaneously. But those are, those are high requirements. If you ask me, do I think that there's a logic to them? Absolutely. But they're expensive. And that's how you get to $715 billion. And in particular, this might be the one that we most immediately and least costly want to address as a way of dealing with how you get down by 20% and how you get maybe down further. All right, let me conclude with a couple things. First of all, um, I think there's an argument to be made that the current imbalance of global security commitments between the United States and its partners is not healthy for the alliances. It causes all kinds of frictions with the Europeans. I mean, they get mad that we don't ask them for their views sometimes and their permission basically ever. And they get very frustrated. It's caused big friction. And I think a legitimate US response to that is to say, well, you guys want representation without taxation. You want to vote without having much skin in the game. And yes, it affects them, and I understand that. But it's bad for the relationship, because it's always bad. If I do something wrong and I annoy my wife, she's mad at me, and I understood I was bad, usually. Or at least those ones are easy to fix, because we just have to meet somewhere in the middle about how bad I was and how much retribution I need to make. And, <laughs> Everyone understands this who's married, right? <laughs> the problems arise when both people feel aggrieved. That's when real problems arise. And those are the kind of situations we're getting increasingly with our partners. Because they feel like we're a bull in the china shop who's starting wars and being reckless. And we say, number one, why should we ask you, we ask you for your opinion, but why should we let you vote? You don't have skin in the game. And we say, furthermore, stop calling us aggressive when we're the only ones in the Persian Gulf. Who's, who, who defends Europe? Both of us together. Who, well, the, we do most of it. Who, does, who, who defends the Persian Gulf? Just us. Who defends East Asia? Well, now it's us and some other allies. So we're doing all three, and at best, our regional allies are helping a little bit with their own backyards. So this is creating substantial resentments on both sides, which is really pernicious to, to partnerships, political partnerships. Um, there's an argument that basically says, in the long run, frankly, if someday in the future threats might be serious enough, and I don't know what those threats are, you know, rise of China, who the heck knows, rise of Russia, you know, in, alien invaders, I, I got no idea. But whatever the threats might be in 25 years, because we're really bad at predicting 25 years out, we might need allies. We might want competent partners. But there's an argument that says, if we want competent partners in our friendly, allied, politically close partners, we're going to basically have to kick them out of the basement and make them get a job. Because this current situation of them relying upon us is just not producing any capability on their part where they could help us if they wanted to. And so kind of withdrawals, withdrawals too strong, reductions in capabilities might actually make us much stronger in the long term in that way. Um, good news, I promised you. <laughs> um, first of all, Again, this is not a, the, the United States is falling to pieces quickly, you know, get, in, get into a compound. And although Hanover would be a terrific place to have a compound if you were going to have one, but, but it, not at all. I, 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 long term prospects for the United States, I'm actually, I'm still quite confident. I think it's, we have the fundamentals of the United States are good. The fiscal imbalance is way out of whack. And that means we're going to go through a couple decades of, you know, higher taxes and lower, substantially lower spending. But does that mean the American experiment has failed? Absolutely not. Does that mean that your kids who are here at Dartmouth or your grandkids are here, who hopefully will be here at Dartmouth one day um, are not going to have good futures? Absolutely not. Where, where would you prefer to live? You know, um, you know, there are other lovely places to live, but, but the United States is pretty darn high on this. So no need to hoard food and shotgun shells. It's going to be an age of austerity, but it's not the end of the world. 
Um, budget constraints are going to create strong pressures to squeeze any savings that we can find from defense. And the good news is, again, there's money to be saved there. If resources were limitless, might you want to have a defense structure force like we had? Might you want to provide the global leadership we have? Might you want to defend everybody from everyone? Perhaps. We've had that debate in a way over the past 20 years, and the American people have, have constantly said, of all the things the federal government does, this is one of our favorite. The military is ve very, very popular. Right? And so if resources were not so constrained, maybe this foreign policy we've been doing for the past 20 years was right on the mark, although it's very costly. Um, but that's not the future. And if resources are seriously constrained, we're going to have to find savings, but we can. And frankly, we can find substantial savings that still leave us with by far the most powerful conventional military force in the world. Oh, by the way, and the most powerful nuclear military force in the world. We wouldn't need to abandon allies and cut them loose. You can still work with allies and even defend allies who can't take care of themselves. And you might be able to find 2% of GDP, which by the way is a large number on an annual basis or even higher. So why don't I stop there and um, take any questions that you might have until, I don't know what time we're supposed to end, so I, I can't see, whenever that time is supposed to be, somebody who's, tell me when I gotta get off the stage. But besides that, I'm happy to take your questions.